Now it looks tonight like uh, watching your face up here look like you're all sitting waiting for the movement of the waters. <laughs> and I hope you don't get disappointed. I'm just a sinner, saved by grace. I'm, nothing, nothing magic about me. I was raised Episcopalian, confirmed, christened, godfather, godmother, and all that stuff. A drunken party after the christening. <laughs> studied Zen Buddhism for years over in the Orient and studied Catholicism under a Jesuit priest, St. Francis, down uh, St. Michael's down in Pensacola. And a Baptist preacher led me to the Lord in the radio station in the record room of a radio station in 1949. His name was Hugh Pyle. And after you've been a preacher about 35 years, when well, I folks get used to looking at you as a preacher, and like I tell him, I was a man 27 years before I was a preacher. I like one of the brethren who said the other day, he was standing up here talking. I don't know which one it was. I forget now. But he was stand up and saying, first of all, he said, I'm a man. And secondly, I'm a saved man. And thirdly, I'm a minister. Now, that's why I look at things. That's why I look at things. And uh, I have no, I'm no, I've got no magic stuff in my back pocket. I mean, if uh, I want God the Holy Spirit to use me, and I want more than that, I want God the Holy Spirit to substitute tonight for me. Amen. That is, if, I want to say what the Lord would say if he had you, had you like I got you right now. I got you for a while, see. I mean, you can't run without looking like a fool or you're under conviction or something. <laughs> and so if I were the Lord, I want to say what he want to say to you. And uh, I don't have anything really heavy for you tonight, nothing real deep or profound. This is a Bible conference, so I thought we'd just have a little Bible study tonight and uh, just take some very, just very simple things. And uh, maybe they're well known to some of you already, I don't know. But uh, there's some things you need to review and go over, and we'll talk about them here tonight. Take your Bible and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Now, in 2 Timothy 2.15, there's an admonition there, and it says study. And as far as I know, that's the only verse in the Bible that says to study the Word of God, the Word of truth. And it says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Now, if you have any Bible but a King James Bible, you don't have that verse in it. Every Bible but a King James Bible is taking the word study out of that verse. If you have a New King James Bible, you don't have that verse in it. There are no Bibles that have study in them except the King James Bible. How many have the word study in the text? Let me see your hands. You got the right Bible. If you don't have study in the text, trade it in and get you the right Bible. Or right, now he says, study to show thyself approved unto God of word, but thee is not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word of truth has proper divisions. And some people get confused about that, and they'll be confused about it until they learn how to study. you got to study. And when you study, then you find the things in the Bible that match and the things in the Bible that don't match. Uh, folks, when you say baptism, they think water. When you say water, they think baptism. Uh, there are seven baptisms in the Bible, the seven of them. You better know which one you're dealing with. There are seven resurrections in the Bible. You better know which one you're coming up at. There are seven judgments in the Bible. See, you see, where do you get that from? From studying the Bible. And you can study it. It has divisions. Now, I'm going to talk tonight about four judgments. There are seven in the Bible, but I'm going to talk about four of them here tonight. And if you can get these four straight, you'll never get seriously messed up on Christian doctrine before you're saved or after you're saved. You can get these four things straight. One judgment, God dealing with sins. One God, judgment, God dealing with sons. One, God, one judgment, God dealing with servants. And one judgment, God dealing with sinners. And those are four separate judgments. And you get those things straight, and a lot of things straighten out for you. All right, now this judgment right here. Take your Bible and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Back to this judgment. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For God hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made, it's in the New Testament if you haven't found it. Some of you are still turning. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 5, what have you been reading? You know, some of you, don't, you know, some of you like, you're like a, a story we tell down in the South about an old colored boy who wanted to be a Presbyterian minister. And he came up for the Presbytery and they said, does you believe the Bible? He said, I believe the Bible from generation to resolution. 
I know you said, well, but you, what's your favorite story in the Bible? He said, my favorite story in the Bible is that that story that they're good Samaritan. And they said, well, would you mind telling us that story so that we know that you know that story? And he said, of course, I wouldn't mind telling you. So he began, he said, there was a certain man that went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell amongst the thorns. <laughs> and the dung sprung up and choked him a thousandfold. And along come Jehu riding in a shack, pick him up, and as they passed under a Jupiter tree, he done caught his hair in the branches thereof. <laughs> and along come Delilah with a pair of shears, and clip him down, he fell upon the stony ground. He look up over his head, he see the cloud up there about the size of a mustard seed that rained 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> so they brought him into a cave where the raven brought him quail in the morning, man in the afternoon. When he come out, there was a river so great that no man could cross it, so he passed by on the other side. As he come down to Jerusalem, he see the old Jezebel sitting up in the sycamore tree and said, some of you birds up there chunked that old gal down. So they pick her up and they chunk her down. He said, pick her up and chunk her down again. So they pick her up and they chunk her down to 70 times seven and the fragments what remained was 12 baskets full, including men, women, and children. And the quest one asked you gentlemen of Presbyterian is this, whose wife she gonna be in the day of judgment? <laughs> <laughs> now, you know why some of you don't think that's funny? I told that to John Rawlins in the church one time in Cincinnati, an old boy down the front, just as serious, a heart attack, said, Amen, Amen. <laughs> All right, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, what does he say? He says, God hath made him, that's Jesus, to be sin for us, who know no sin, that's Jesus, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, what is that thing? That's God judging his son. That's God turning his son into sin. You see the personification? It isn't just that he bore your sins. It goes much deeper than that. It says God made him to be sin. You see the singular? It isn't just bearing sins. He turned into the personification of sin. That's why he said Moses lived with the serpent. He becomes personification of sin, almost like the devil. It's so close, you can't even get them apart. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, referring to himself. Jesus Christ took your sin the same time he became sin. John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin, singular, of the world, the whole thing. So God's judgment fell on the back of his helpless son on Golgotha. They came to a place called Golgotha, and there they crucified him. They crucified two thieves with him and parted his garments and cast lots for his garments and said, Ah, oh, thou that be the Son of God, come down the cross and save thyself and us. He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the Christ of Israel, let him come down the cross, and we will believe. And the two thieves were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. And pretty soon that thing was going on, one thief turned another thief and said, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art the same condemnation we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds? But this man had done nothing amiss. And turning to Jesus, he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest to thy kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee today, shalt thou be with me in paradise. And when the sixth and ninth hour there was darkness over the face of the earth, and a great earthquake, and the graves were opened, the bodies of many of the saints that slept arose, and were seen in the city following his resurrection, when the centurion saw it, he said, Truly this was a righteous man. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he says, What a man say in hell? I thirst. That's what a fellow says in hell. My God, my God, why hast thou forsake? That's what a fellow says in hell. Didn't say, My Father, you can't break up the Trinity. He said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's suffering what you ought to suffer in hell up there. What's going on? Well, the judgment of God is falling on him. The judgment of God fell on Jesus Christ in my place. I was talking one time with one of my Catholic friends and witnessed to him, and I said, uh, Well, Christ died for you. You know that? He said, Oh, yeah, I know he died for everybody. I said, Yeah, but he died for you. He said, Well, sure, he died for the whole world. I said, Do you believe that Christ died for sinners? He said, Yeah, sure, I believe that. I said, we repeat, he said, we repeat that in our creed about Christ dying for sinners. And I said, could you name me a sinner he died for? And he couldn't name me a sinner he died for. Why don't you ask me that question? Ask me that question, name me a sinner that Christ died for. I can't name of the sinner Jesus Christ died for. Peter S. Ruckman. 
What's the S for? Sinner. <laughs> Christ died for my sins according to the Scriptures, was buried, and rose again the third day from the dead according to the Scripture. Now you folks that worry about going to heaven and when you die, worried about losing it, worried about your sins, I've got good news for you. You trust Jesus Christ, you're a Savior, you go to heaven when you die. You say, but what if? Oh, that's over here. We're not talking about that. We're talking about over here. You've got to get that thing straight. You heard that fellow Ripley from Tennessee talking about how he got converted from a Church of God doctrine to a Baptist doctrine. He got converted because he got studying his Bible and found out what was going on. You want to go to heaven? Trust Jesus Christ. You want to go to hell? Trust something else. You want a symbol? That's you want any plenty? You want to go to hell? Trust your mother. Trust your priest. Trust your church. Trust the sacraments. Trust your baptism. You want to go to hell? Keep the Ten Commandments. You want to go to hell? Keep the Golden Rule. One way to hell is as good as another. You want to go to heaven? Trust Jesus Christ. Amen. You want to go to hell? Get a baptism and talk in tongues. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. <laughs> And you say, no, yes. <laughs> I got the decibels, yes. <laughs> I can out yell you right now, yes. You want to go to heaven? Trust Jesus Christ. Isn't that simple? It's so simple. You know why God made it simple? Because you're so stupid. <laughs> I've got a, got a friend down in the South City. He said, if, if ignorance is bliss, I'm a blizzard. <laughs> Listen, God didn't make salvation for smart people. Some of you never make it. And God never made salvation for good people. I'd never made it. I was a wicked man. If salvation just for good people, I never could have got in. Are these fellows talking about their lack of education, lack of smart, you know, and lack of uh, intellectuality and this and that? I didn't like any of that stuff, man. I had 22 years of education before I was saved, an IQ of 140 when I was 22 and 150 now. I'm not liking that. That wasn't my problem. My problem was wickedness. That was my problem. And God made this thing so a dumb man can get saved and a wicked man can get saved. You want to get saved? Come on here and trust Jesus Christ. And I don't mean a wafer either, a butt or a, a, a jug of a hooch. What we call moonshine down home. <clears throat> You, I, one time my little girl Laura was out in the backyard with her mother and they're out there in the garden and a bee was buzzing around and Laura said, Mama, she said, I'm afraid that bee will sting me. And Sherry said, why, honey, that bee won't sting you. And she said, well, how do you know it won't? And Sherry said, uh, scratching her arm where the sting was left in her arm, she said, because it's always stung me and it stingers right here. You see, it can't sting twice. I said, it can't sting twice. Oh, death, where is thy sting? It can't sting twice. Back in the old days, they'd go, be going across the, the, uh, the prairie or there in those kind of starter wagons and uh, getting out there in West Kansas and Colorado and that prairie grass out there. Sometimes it was a big brush fire. And those brush fire would start across the prairie, a brush fire. If you ever had, had to try to put out fire in six-foot grass in a 40-mile-an-hour wind, you know what's going on. I mean, you can pray or cuss or get drunk. That's about all you can do. And they get out there, that prayer fire will be sweeping across the mirror, that breeze, 20, 20 miles an hour. They just step out and strike tinder and backfire that thing and set fire to the grass in front of them and blow out in front of them. They take the wagon and all the kid and little ones and pull them off from that thing and stand the burnout part. And when the fire caught up to them, it couldn't burn them. You say, why? It had already been burnt out. I said, it had already been burnt out. You need to get that. Just get that one simple little thing, man. Your life will never be the same again. You can't go to hell. He took your hell for you. You see these people, these, these fellow heard a Catholic priest talk one time, you know, and talked about doing this and doing that. When he got all through, the fellow said to one of his buddies, that sure sounds like a complicated plan of salvation. <laughs> it sure is, brother. It sure is. Salvation is that complicated. If you want to mess up a Catholic priest or a Campbellite elder, about 20 of a dozen, half a dozen, one, 20 of another, tell you, you ask them to talk to you about imputation. Imputation is a Bible term. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Amen. What does that mean? I'll show you what it means. 
Is this thing right here? We'll pretend this here is a book, a diary about my life. We'll pretend this book here is a diary of the life of Jesus Christ, God's Son. Well, I trust Christ my Savior. You know the first thing God does? God takes my old dirty book here with all my dirty, rotten, filthy, wicked sins in it, and all of all my breaking the commandments and writes across it, this is the life of Jesus Christ. Now, if some of you Christians don't believe that, because you haven't been reading your Bible, but the Bible says God imputed our trespasses unto him and didn't charge us, but charged to him. He takes my place. And then he takes the book of this holy, sinless life, the spotless life of the third person, the Trinity, and he writes down, this is the life of Peter S. Ruckman. And some of you folks have been saved five years and don't understand that yet. You know what that thing is? That's imputation. God takes my sins and charges them to his son, and God takes his righteousness and charges it to me. <laughs> I've got it. <laughs> I got it. I got it. I got it. <laughs> folks say, you're liable to lose it. I can't lose it. It's his. <laughs> David didn't say, Restore to, me the, Restore to me the joy of my salvation. He said, Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. It's his. Christ dies on the cross. He says, It is finished. You want to go to heaven? Trust Jesus Christ. You want to go to hell? Trust something else. You say, What? Don't make any difference. Six of one, half a dozen other. The main road to hell are our people. You want to go to heaven? Trust Jesus Christ. You want to go to hell? Trust something else. You say, What if you trust Jesus Christ and then? We're not, we're not talking about that. Heaven or hell is settled right there. Now, if you're talking about living right, we'll talk about it over here. But we're not talking about living right over here. We're talking about going to heaven or hell right there. You go right there. I like what that old mission superintendent said to a bum one night who was kneeling on his knees out at the altar and praying and screaming and crying and saying, I'm lost, I'm lost, oh my God, what am I going to do? I'm going to go to hell, what am I going to do? And the superintendent of mission said, there's nothing you can do. And he said, yeah, but I don't want to go to hell. And he said, too bad, you're going. <laughs> and the fellow said, yeah, but my God, what can I do? And the superintendent said, nothing, absolutely nothing. It's already been done. You see, Christ dies on the cross. He said, it is finished. What can you do? I'll tell you what you can do, nothing. <laughs> You'll have to trust what God did. That's what we're after. That's what we're after. All right, now let's talk about something else. One of these days, if you've been saved, God's uh, going to judge you as a son. You say, when does that take place? Well, the Bible says, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but the of power and love of a sound mind, and the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You read in your Bible, as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name, which were born, not of the will of the man, the will of the flesh, but born of God. You're a child of God. You're in the family. Once you're in the family, then you have a father, and your father cares for you and looks after you. And the Bible says, as one whom his father pity, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. As one whom his mother comforts, so the Lord uh, will comfort you. You may have never had a good father or mother, but when you get saved, you have the best father and mother in the universe. That's God, God. There's a difference in mothers and fathers. A, a father pities, a mother comforts. You understand the difference in that? They're not the same. A uh, mother, a boy in, the, in a football game goes through the line and gets cut out in a stretcher and his mother's up in the stand. And she's saying, oh, my poor boy. And the daddy is saying, nice try, son. <laughs> There's a difference in approach, you know. And the Bible says, when my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Some of you had a father that wasn't worth shooting. Amen, 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 amen. And some of you had a mother that wasn't fit to raise a dog, let alone a kid. Amen, 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 amen. Now, a hundred years ago in the country, you couldn't say that, but you can say that now. You can say that now. Rochester, New York's got probably in a hundred women aren't fit to raise a dog or a cat, let alone a child. Yes, yes, yes. And come up and like that, maybe you never had the kind of love you ought to have. Don't despair. You trust Christ, and you get the right father and the right mother. Amen. You take Yankees, they generally tend to be too hard on their kids and don't love them enough. And Southerners, they tend to love the kids too much and not be hard on them enough. That's general. It should be this way, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, you see. It's both. 
Don't you worry about God, your Heavenly Father. He'll know just the right balance. Just the right balance. And when you have a beating come, out will come the belt. You say, well, what if I get saved and I go out and kill somebody? Well, you might die in the electric chair or die in jail. You say, what about my salvation? Well, are you still in the family? When you're born again, whose seed are you born of? Well, you're born of God's seed, being born of incorruptible seed by the Word of God that liveth and abideth forever. My name's Ruckman. When will I cease to be John Hamilton Ruckman's son? Never. Never. I'm born of his seed. I can't be unborn again. Why, some of you folks worry about losing your salvation. Do you realize how much time you're wasting? Why don't you get busy working for God? What do you want about losing your salvation for? Why, how, how could you lose your salvation? You'd have to be born again and again and again and again and again. <laughs> Christ didn't say, except a man be born again and again and again and again and again. He said, except a man be born again. When you're born again, you're born of incorruptible seed by the word of God, listen, that liveth and abideth forever. Amen. You can't lose it. You can't lose it. See, what if I did that? You're just wasting your time. You're wasting your time. If one of my boys committed a murder and they took him out there and gave him capital punishment, on his grave would be my name. You say, what if they change the name? Wouldn't make a difference. He'd still be my seed. I have known Christians to do everything I ever heard of unsaved people doing. And I know some of you don't believe that. And I know, I know how the people look at it these days. They say, well, the trouble is they weren't really saved. I, 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 don't, I don't agree with some of the brethren on that. I don't agree with them all. I've known Christians for years and years and years. I've been working for Christians for 35 years, and as God is my witness, I have known saved people to do everything I've ever heard of unsaved people doing with a possible exception of a sex murder. And that might happen too. You say, Rupert, I just don't believe that. You're a fool if you don't believe that because that shows you're not on your guard. Amen. Every now and then something happens, a Christian gets some bad trouble and somebody say, well, I just don't see how he could have been going to church and studying the Bible and reading the Bible and witnessing, you know, and doing all this and that, and, and but this kind of thing happened to him. You don't see that because you don't estimate the power of the devil. That's the problem. Listen, kids, any under 60, listen, kids, you lay down that book for a while and get off your knees for a while and leave a vacuum in your life for a while and quit serving God for a while, you don't know how far you're going to drop. You drop plumb to the bottom, boy. I've seen them. I've seen them. The thing is, you've got to stay confessed up and prayed up every day, judged every day. Why? You're God's son. Whom the Lord loveth, he chaseth. God's not going to take off you what he'll take off on the saved people. Got to get out the belt. Got to whip you. You go home first class, second class, or third class. I know a preacher down in Ohio. He has a wife, bless her heart. She's been out in her salvation ever since she was saved. I guess about 25 years. And every man that's come to that church, she talks to him about salvation, trying to get saved over again. And I, she was talking to me about one time in a restaurant and talking, you know, and I, Finally, just went round and round, get nowhere. These people doubt the salvation. Well, they can get tie up for days at a time. And finally, I said to her, I said, well, I said, let me ask you this. I said, uh, what are you trusting to get you to heaven? She said, well, I know what you're supposed to say to that, but I'm not sure whether I'm trusting that or not. I said, well, don't tell me what you think a person ought to say. I said, you don't want to go to hell, do you? She said, oh, no, 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 I don't go to hell. I said, well, you trust and keep on keeping you out. What you counting on keeping you out? She said, well, I know the answer to that. I said, don't give me the answer. <laughs> Tell me what you're trusting to keep you out. <laughs> and she said, the blood of Jesus. And I shook my head. I said, I got bad news, you lady. She said, what's that? I said, you've got to go to heaven anyway. <laughs> 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 Listen, if, if your hope is building nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, you're going to heaven. Amen. Too late to back out now. <laughs> you said, I go back in the world. Lord, knock you in the head. You say, I'll go back and get drunk. Okay, go back and get drunk, wind up in a hospital, lose your shirt, lose your money, bust up your home, make a fool out of yourself, and you go home to heaven anyway. It, you know what religion is? It's reliance. You see this thing right here? See this pulpit right here? I'm leaning on this thing. Now, if you take that thing out, you know which way I'll fall? I'll not fall this way. <laughs> you know why? I'm counting on it holding me up. You see, I'm counting on the thing holding me up. I'm planning on it. If you don't hold me up, I'm falling. My hope is built on nothing less 
than Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. I'm not leaning on the church. I'm not leaning on the sacraments. I'm leaning on the Lord Jesus Christ. If he gives way, I'm a dead duck. You got it? What you counting on? I saw something down in Pensacola one time I'll never forget, and it's been years and years ago. I probably told you about it before. It's worth repeating. And I saw, I saw a colored woman down there one time going down the street. And she had a little white boy on her hand. She was taking him somewhere. For some, some woman, she'd taken that boy somewhere, babysitting. That boy was about four years old, and he didn't want to go where they were going. And she must have weighed about 350 pounds, and she walking down that street, towing that little boy after, and he was hitting the ground about every four steps, just screaming and squalling. And she was going down there singing, la si da si da si da boink, 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 boink. <laughs> kid bouncing along there. And I watched that kid being dragged along there, and I said to myself, you know what that is, picture of? That's a picture of a disobedient Christian going home to heaven. <laughs> boink, 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 boink. <laughs> I'm in the Holy Spirit, just kiss you by the hand and say, let's go home, boy. Boom, 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 boom. You want to go that way? Well, you can go easy, you can go hard, but you're going. You're going. You'll say, what are you drawing up there? I'm drawing a fellow to judging his sins in the light of the Word. Take your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians. And look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30. I'm putting the loincloth on him for the sake of decency. But when we come before God, all things are naked and open before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The spell of judging your sin, the light of what? In the light of the word. The entrance of thy uh, word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. You don't spend any time in your Bible. You won't know what sin to confess, which one to judge. Jesus Christ said, I have sanctified you. He said, I have cleansed you through the washing of the water of the Word. Now you're clean through the Word, through the Word, through the Word that I have spoken to you. We don't spend time in the King James Bible just because we believe it's the Word of God. I believe it's the Word of God. That isn't why I spend a lot of time in it. You know one reason I spend a lot of time in it? To try to stay clean. Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy Word. That's the business. Now you take this thing here, here, God dealt with you with your sins, and there he deals with you, not as a sinner, but as a son. It's a different relationship. Over here, he's dealing with you as an unsaved man in darkness and the, with the wrath of God falling on his sins, consigned to hell forever, forsaken by God, and now you're in the family. He's not going to deal with you the same way, Christian. He's going to deal with you like you deal with your children. Do you love your kids? If you love your kids, you whip them once in a while. Do you enjoy whipping them? Is there a parent that's building really enjoy whipping them? If you enjoy whipping them, you're a sadist. I don't enjoy whipping my kids. I've never enjoyed whipping my kids, but I've whipped them. I've whipped them. I sure have. Rachel, little old girl, she did something real bad, but I caught her at it. And I caught her good, too, boy. And I got her, and I blistered her good, too. And I mean, boy, the next day when I drove up in the yard, the day after that whipping, I drove up in the yard. She's out playing in the front yard. When I came driving the driveway, she waved a hand at me and said, I'm being good, Daddy. I'm being good. <laughs> oh. oh, that just blow your day, man. Just ruin you. But I've often thought of that, boy. I've thought of that many a time. Many a time, you know, before I get up to preach, I'm back in a prayer place by myself someplace and hold up my hand and say, I'm being good, Daddy. I'm being good. Yeah. Listen, there's some things about between you and the Lord you'll never know. Do you have children? Do you have children? You watch that kid, watch that kid, and that kid is just like you. How many times have I told you? <laughs> well, how many times the Lord told you, huh? The little boy lying in bed at night. Daddy, I want a drink of water. Shut up and go to sleep. <laughs> Ten minutes later, I'm thirsty, Daddy. Can I get shut up? Or go to, I'll get up and whipped if you don't shut up. Ten minutes later, Daddy, you shut up one more time, I'll come there and whip you. Silence. Ten minutes later, Daddy, when you get up to whip me, would you get me a glass of water? <laughs> <laughs> 
You can't do nothing with that, brother. You might just as well get up and go ahead and get it, you know. Now listen. The lesson, the thing is, when you want to take your beating like a man, the relationship between you and the father gets gets a little better. I found out my father, when he whipped me, the best way to do was get in close to him. That way he couldn't get leverage on the whip. If you run from him, you're out there, so he can swing that thing four feet, boy, and he'll raise blisters on you, man. But if you get in close, it kind of cramps him coming down. <laughs> There's a great moral lesson in that, brother. <laughs> when the bell starts coming down, get in close. Don't run. Don't run. Christians get back and they quit going to church. They get back and quit reading the Bibles and quit coming to prayer meeting. That's the time to double the pace and get in closer. So the belt don't hit you so hard. I remember one day I had my little boy talking out in the breezeway, and I just whipped Pete. And he about four or five years old. I'd whip him a good one. I give him a good one. I give him one. They don't forget it. And Mike was out there. He must have been about seven. And old Pete was bawling and squalling and sniffling, been sniffing for about fifteen minutes. And I heard Mike tell him, "Oh, why don't you shut up?" <laughs> and and he said, "You." He said, "He's not whipping you anymore." And Pete said, "Yeah, but boy, Daddy whips hard. Man, he whips hard. It hurts." And old Mike said, I bet I wouldn't cry if he whipped me. <laughs> he never should have said that. <laughs> and I was right around the room, the corner there, I stepped around and said, what'd you say, boy? <laughs> and he, I'll, I'll take my hand off him. He had guts, boy. He had guts. He just sort of said, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I got me a willow switch about that long. Butt end about as big as your finger, and end like a darning needle. You know that? That has that's the most horrifying sound. You just know it hadn't got your best interest at heart. I came out, smacked him, and I'll 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 I'll, I'll say he he tried. I'll say that for him. He tried. He had the guts, boy. I hit him the first time, boy, and he just turned crimson. He didn't let out a squeak. I hit him the second time. He just turned beet red and went. <laughs> and the third time, you could have heard him a quarter mile down the road, man. <laughs> now listen, listen. Don't you come up to your heavenly father and say, you can't make me cry. That's the wrong thing to say. That's the wrong thing to say. Confess your sins. Judge your sins. You got 1 Corinthians open there? All right, look at the passage there, about 11, verse 30, someplace in there. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. You see that? God chases his children. Why? They're not going to go to hell. Somebody said, well, I just wouldn't take one of my own sons and put him in hell. Neither would God. You say, well, then God wouldn't send anybody to hell. Yeah, but not everybody is his son. You say, well, they're bigoted, dogmatic. Well, no more than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said about a certain class of people, ye are your father the devil. Don't you go get mad with me. Get mad with Christ. It's the Bible that says you're not a child of God until you're born again. It's the Bible that says you're not a child of God until you've had faith in Jesus Christ. I didn't write that book. I was called to preach that book, but I didn't write that book. You're not a son of God or a child of God until you trust Jesus Christ. You want to go to heaven? Trust Christ. You want to go to hell? Trust something else. You want to live a happy Christian life? Judge your sins and confess them, and by the grace of God, put them away. You want to live a miserable Christian life? Just go your way and do as you please. Folks, that's all there is to it. Sometimes it gets so complicated and so manifold, you think there's all kinds of angles. There ain't no angle to it. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. I wish I had something else for you. I wish I had something real profound, you know, deep to put on you. <laughs> but that's just the way it is. If you want to be happy, trust and obey. You ought to be miserable, do it your way. Yeah. Amen, amen. That's all there is to it. David never had any peace till he got on his knees, confessed his sins. That old boy messed around with uh, Uriah's wife there, and that illegitimate baby came, and he <laughs> brought in Uriah there and tried to get him drunk to go down and sleep with his wife. So people think the kid was... Uriah's kid instead of his. Well, Uriah pulled a fast one on him and didn't go down to see his wife. 
Then he got him drunk the next night, hoping if he got drunk, he wouldn't know what he was doing and go down and see her. And he didn't. You know the story. Terrible story. And you go through that thing, and uh, uh, pretty soon the <laughs> son you arrive back to the battlefront, and, uh, and he died. He is killed in action. Don't you know some terrible weeks for David? Sleep at night up there, wondering, will anybody find out about it? What if they found out? The noise in the hallway. Gets up, draws the sword, pulls the curtain, looks down the hallway, see if anybody's coming. Down there in the street, in the middle of the night, baby begins to cry. About 2 o'clock in the morning, wakes up in a sweat, goes up and looks down across the palace roof. What's wrong with some of you folks? That ain't no mental problem with you, nothing of the kind. What some of you folks need to do is just get down and get on a good old-fashioned altar, prayer altar, get down there flat in your face and just get that place just wet enough where you can take a mop and mop that thing up. That's the problem. You say, we don't know what, you dirty, rotten sins. You say, you Christians, you Christians, you Christians. You say, Christians don't do stuff like that. Yes, they sure do. They sure do. And you know what happened to you? You get clean out tonight, you go home, you sleep with a good conscience. A good conscience can sleep in a hurricane, man. You don't have to worry about the wrong phone call, the wrong knock on the door. Get the thing right. Get it clean. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No priest, the priest up there. If you sin against somebody, go tell them about it. If you sin against the church, you'll have to tell it to the church. But it's a sin where nobody knows about but you and the Lord. You confess that thing to God and get it fixed up with God. I don't know, boy down in Panama City used to phone me up all the time. Now, I say all the time, he'd phone me, not all the time, but he'd phone me up about once every three months. Every time he'd phone me after 12 o'clock. And he always sounded like he was drunk when he'd phone up. Hoarse voice, rough voice. And the first couple of times he talked, he just let me know he was on the save and going to hell and hung up before I could do much with him in the plan of salvation. And the third time, I kept him on the line for a while and got talking with him. And I gave him the plan of salvation, tried to lead him to Christ over the phone. And he said, but preacher, but preacher, he said, but preacher, you don't know what I've done. I said, I don't care what you've done. The Bible says, come now, say, if the Lord let us reason together, though your sin be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He says, yeah, but I've killed a man. I was telling you, kill a man or not. The brother Jesus Christ, God's son, come to a small sin. He said, but I'm, I, I mean cold blood. I said, I don't care if it's cold blood or not. Moses killed a man in cold blood. I said, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanse us from all sin. Not just the ones you don't do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and over the phone he said, but I'm, uh, I'm a hit man. He said, I've killed a lot of people for money. I said, bud, either hang up or listen. <laughs> The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from A double L, all sin. That's it. You won't do it. He said, Okay, Father. <laughs> <laughs> Guess what religion he was? <laughs> well, I don't mind. I'm a father. I got seven kids. <laughs> and so I bowed my head over the telephone, closed my eyes, and prayed with him. He prayed, and he got saved, received the Lord. And you know something about uh, two months later, that guy phoned me up, doubting his salvation. And about two months later, he pulled me up, doubt the salvation. He never did get on top. And the last time I talked to that poor critter, I said, listen, bud, I said, I can't take any more of my time, your time with this stuff. Maybe you'll see those face, those dying men, the day you die, and maybe in your dreams at night, you'll wake up screaming with the face of those dead men and women in front of you. Maybe you'll have to live without the rest of your life. You reap what you sow, but God's not lying when he told you what he told you. And if you trusted his son, your sins are under the blood. I wouldn't tell you anything different than what I told him. Anybody like that here tonight? What I said for him goes for you. Want to go to heaven? Trust Christ. Want to go to hell? Trust something else. Want to live a happy Christian life? Stay judged up. Stay confessed up. Don't get behind. You want to be miserable? Just go your way and do what you want to do. Now find it down here. This is the third judgment. In this judgment here, God will judge you as a servant. Now you understand a servant works. And the Bible says, to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted him for righteousness. A man is not saved by works. We're not kept saved by works. 
We're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. But we're to go to work. We're a peculiar people. We should be zealous of good works. God works in us both to do, will do with good pleasure. Some Baptists get funny idea because they're saved by grace through faith and no works. They're just supposed to sit down and do nothing the rest of the time. You're like a fellow's house on fire, and the guy said, what are you doing? He said, I'm praying for rain. <laughs> you have Christians like that. You have, we have them come to school sometimes. They believe in living by faith. You know, their wife's name is Faith, and she works and pays a bill. <laughs> they believe in living by faith. They're living off everybody else's faith and borrowing the money. When are you going to go to work? Go to work today, son of my vineyard. You say, well, Brother Robin, I'd just be happy if I could just make it to heaven. I'm so poor and so wretched and so miserable and so wicked. If I just barely make it to heaven, I'll be satisfied. No, you won't. No, you won't. Now, folks, you figure that thing out. You, you go home at night, find the house burned down, your wife burned to death, your children burned to death, or your furniture burned up, car burned up. You go next door and say, let's get out and celebrate. Have a steak dinner tonight. I got out alive. It won't be that way. It won't be that way. You're wrong. When you got saved, you got saved to save others. You get on by the skin of your teeth and leave them out there, you won't be celebrating. You won't be celebrating. Well, I got through, my family all burned up, but I, no, people do not like that. That isn't the way it is. Or I take your Bible and turn to 2 Corinthians 5.10. 2 Corinthians 5.10. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 10, you'll find when you're judged here, you're judged as a servant. That was Paul's favorite term for himself. When he spoke of himself, he always liked to refer to himself as a bond servant, a servant of Jesus Christ. That word is a word for slave. It means a bond servant bought, bought on the block and knocked down at a price. The Bible says you're bought with a price. In 2 Corinthians 5, 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the deeds done in the body, whether they be good or whether they be bad or evil. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You want to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. In 2 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 10, this thing is described. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, he says, Other foundation can no man lay than that that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every day man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it and reveal it by fire, and the fire shall try the man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide that he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Yet he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. That's a picture of a Christian who is saved by fire, and the fire doesn't touch him. It's not the fire of purgatory. It's a fire that burns up your works. It's what you did for the Lord after you were saved. They're tested. God tests your motive. You're a servant. A servant should serve. You're saved by grace through faith. And you don't have to work to get saved. You don't have to work to stay saved. But if you love the Lord Jesus, you will go to work. You know, I've talked this week about God's love for you and Christ's love for you. Well, what have you done in return? Brother sitting up here the night says, I've given all for thee. What hast thou given for me? But what have you? You say a tithe. Ain't that something? Ain't that something? You really love the Lord, do you? Well, let's see it. Get in the vineyard. Pick up the hoe. Pick up the rake. Get to work. Let's see how much you love the Lord. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. You know what that means? That means you're a bond slave. You're knocked down the block. So, bam, you're gone. You're not your own. Christians say, well, I want to go to the church of my choice. Don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. That's the most ungodly thing you possibly could do. Don't ever go to the church of your choice. Who are you? You should be going to the church of the master's choice. Did you ever consult the master about where to go? Of course not, some of you. You think you're able to guide your own life, don't you? You're a smart cookie, aren't you? You've got confidence in yourself. The greatest Christian ever lived said, we are those that rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ and put no confidence in the flesh. But you know the right church, do you? I'll just bet you do. Did you ever pray about it? 
my scholarly brethren say we prefer the King James Bible. I don't. <laughs> they say we use it because we prefer it. Don't ever prefer it. I wouldn't think of taking that book because I preferred it. I take that book because it's God's book. Amen. And if God told me that wasn't his book, I'd dump it and get me another one. Amen. Preference, choice. Get mighty quiet here, preacher. Some of you Yankees, boy, you, you think I'm opinionated. You saw hump on yourself. You don't know where you're at, man. You think because you've raised four or five kids, you've got grandchildren, a good piece of land out here in some in the back, you're smart. Let me tell you something. You can waste your whole life just running it yourself. The greatest Christian in that book, he gave himself over to God and said, I'm a servant. I'm a bond servant. Knocked down on the block. You can get crowned at the judgment seat of Christ. There are rewards. You say, I don't care to have a reward. Yes, you do. You haven't thought that thing through. You haven't thought it through. What could be greater than having the one that loved you enough to die for you? Say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter the joy of thy Lord. What's greater than that? There's nothing any greater than that. You're not going to sit in television any, this year any, or equal that. You're going to sit on that boob tube, watch that thing 24 hours a day from now till the 1st of January and the next January. You'll never see anything as great as the creator of the universe patting you on the back and saying, voicing, are not even you in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For example, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me in that day, and not to me only, but also to all them that love is appearing. Those are rewards passed out by the Lord Jesus Christ for faithful service. You want rewards? Go to work. You want a happy life? Confess your sins. You want to go to heaven? Trust Christ. You want to go to heaven? Trust Christ. You want to go to hell? Trust something else. You want a happy life? Stay judged up, stay confessed up. You want a miserable life? Forget it. You want rewards? Go to work. You don't want any want rewards? Lie down and sleep. And there'll come a day you wish to God you'd pick up the hoe and got out there. There's a fellow in that Bible named Esau, and the Bible said when he came to his daddy, he said, haven't you got a blessing, a blessing for me, oh, my father? And lifted up his voice and wept bitterly, and his daddy said, I've given everything you've got to Jacob. And the Bible said when he came afterward to get a blessing, he couldn't find it, though he sought it carefully with tears. At the judgment seat of Christ, there are going to be Christians up there saying, I just didn't know it'd be like this. I didn't know it'd be like this. I didn't know it'd be like this. If I knew it was going to be like this, I'd have done the thing different. Let me go back down again. Let me do it again. If I knew it was going to be like this, I'd suffer more. I'd stick my neck out more. I'd be a fool for Christ's sake. Let me do it again. The Lord say, too late. Listen, when you get up there, Christian people I don't know how much the book you know and how much you don't know, but if that book is right, when you get up to heaven and get through that thing, you're going to be just like Jesus Christ. You couldn't come down here and suffer again. The time to suffer is now. You hear me? The time to have folks cuss you out is now. Are you, are you getting cussed out? Well, tend to it if you're not. <laughs> are you suffering reproach now? If you're not, get doing something where you will. After a while, it'll be too late. All right, four, three judgments. God judges the, your sin right there. He judges as a son right there. He judges the servant right there. Take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Some of you Christians just waiting, waiting, and waiting, and waiting, and waiting. Make yourself available. Put yourself at the Lord's disposal. Disposal. I'm, I'm, I'm expendable. On the platform of night, oh Lord, here I am. Okay. Any way you want to use me, go. Come for platform. Here I am on the platform. Anyone you want to use me, go. Let's go. I'm available. Time is too short to put myself in anybody's disposal but the Lord's. Count your many obligations. Name them one by one, and it will surprise you what you haven't done. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. I saw a great white throne, him that sat upon it, from whose face heaven and earth fled away, and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, the small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged according to their works. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now, that thing there is what they call the last judgment of the unsaved dead. That's the white throne judgment. When that judgment takes place, you saved people sitting here tonight are going to judge angels. 
Again, I don't know how much of the Bible you know, but if the Bible is true, you're going to judge angels. First Corinthians chapter 6, know ye not the saints to judge angels? Know ye not the saints to judge the world? You say, what about that stuff? Yeah, what about that stuff? Hey, man, what about that stuff? Hasn't that got me more importance than an election? You see, the devil just gets you caught up with this stuff going on, and there's nothing to it. <laughs> it just comes and goes. That's the big stuff there. Someday you're going to judge. Now, what's going to happen there? Unsaved people are going to come up, the world. And someday you're going to get to judge the world. Now, you Christian people, you don't get a chance to judge the world right now. They're judging you. The world looking at you, and if you live for the Lord, they say you're a fanatic, and if you don't, they say you're a hypocrite. You can't win either way. And they're judging you, and someday you're going to judge them. Now, I'm going to depart from this thing, doctrine, a little bit here, and I'm going to go to another place in the Bible. And although doctrine of this isn't the exact setting, it will still illustrate it. In Matthew chapter 22, there's an illustration there about a king that has a wedding for his son. And he sends the servants out in the highways to get guests for the wedding. And they go out there, and they furnish the wedding with guests. And the king comes in there and sees a man that has, doesn't have on a wedding garment, and he's speechless. And the king tells him, cast that fellow, take that fellow hand and, and bind him hand and foot, and cast him out of darkness. Now, I'm sure you know your Bible well enough to know that's a tribulation passage, and that deals primarily with the great tribulation and the guests at the wedding, not the bride itself. And yet there's a tremendous application there for an unsaved person. Because when those people went out there in those days to invite a fellow into a marriage, they took a white robe out with them, and it was a kind of a badge that got him through the front gate. His passport into the feast was his clothes, his apparel. Fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And the fellow would go out there and go up down the street and stop a fellow and say, uh, Hey, you want to go to a wedding? Who's getting married? King's son? Oh, the king's son, yes. Well, I'm afraid I'm not in that kind of station. I'm not a blue blood or anything. Well, the king said, put on this robe here. You can get in the front gate. Oh, that thing? Yeah, it's a white linen robe. The king bought it. Uh, it doesn't look very... Doesn't, I know this is my size. It doesn't fit too well. I get my stuff tailor-made at Hart Shaffer and Mark's. You want to go to the wedding? Yes. Put it on. Well, what owe you for it? Nothing. Look here. My daddy taught me to pay my way. It's worth a hundred bucks. I won't take a hundred bucks. Well, I won't take your robe back. Okay, goodbye. On down the street. That's how folks are. Stop some lady down there. You want to go to a wedding? Oh, yes. Who's getting married? The king's son. Oh, in the palace? Yes. Oh, yes. I'd love to go. Fine. Take this robe and put it on. That thing? <laughs> yeah, you've got to have that to get in the gate. Why doesn't the bit becoming to me? It isn't stylish at all. I wouldn't be seen dead in that. Good day, on down the street. Come around the corner, come to an alley. Here's old Black Jack Mason sitting there, cross-legged, been begging all day, patch over his eye, leg a stump, one of his hands a stump. Servant come up and says, hey, boy, you want to go to a wedding? <laughs> Me at a wedding. <laughs> Got to pull my leg, man? <laughs> Oh, it's the king going to have a wedding. The king, yeah, the king, pretty good. Ah. You want to go to a wedding? The king said, whosoever will, let him come. Yeah, what's the catch, buddy? No catch, just take this robe and put it on. So what's the gimmick? What does it cost? Don't cost nothing, it's free. If you want it, take it. You kidding? Try me out and see if I'm kidding. Grab the robe. Got in. <laughs> <laughs> The violent take it before us, boy. And in that place came the lame and the maim and the halt and the crippled and the blind coming there dressed in the righteousness of the king. And all those fine, cultured, wonderful, educated religious folks, all them 32nd degree masons and all them National Education Association and all them presbyters and stewards and head of the Lady Society and the taking up the Lottie Moon offering, they never got in. Do you know, people are so strange about these things. One fellow there said, he said, I've got a, I've, I've got a yoke of oxen. I've got to prove them and I can't go. Well, this was a supper he was invited to. You know what a supper is, don't you? I mean, down south, you know what a supper is. That's the even meal. 
What's he doing? He's doing going out to prove a yoke of oxen at six o'clock at night. Boy, they come up with them, don't they? But I said, I got, I married a wife. Well, what woman just got married wouldn't like to attend the wedding, you know? They come up with all kinds of stuff, you know. Alibis, alibis, alibis. Why, why George Gallup gave a poll back there in about 1959. He has some pretty good polls, you know. He gets a lot more public opinion than the news media does. And George Gallup had a poll back there in 1959 and asked the American public something like uh, 500,000 people in, in about uh, 48 states. He asked them who they'd like to have most come to their house for dinner as a guest. And the first one was Abraham Lincoln. And the second was FDR. And the third one was Eisenhower. You know who was 11 on that list? Jesus Christ. Imagine somebody would rather have Lincoln in their house than Jesus Christ. I can't imagine that. I can't imagine that. What a lot of country. If I could have my choice of anybody to be in my house, I wouldn't have to flip a coin about who it would be. It wouldn't be 11 on my list. While people are so funny, if you said, I'm going to have a big blowout down here at the Marriott Hotel, and it's free, and you're going to come in, and we're going to have uh, Michael Jackson, you know, and Johnny Carson, and Dean Martin, and Belushi, you know, and Jack Lennon, you know, and Elvis Presley, and we're going to have in Liz Taylor, and the five guys she married, and President Reagan, you know, and, and Bush, and Senator Helms, you know, and Mondale, and all the fruits, and Frisco, and we're going to have a rock band in here, and we're going to have black-eyed peas and purple hull peas and crowder peas and English peas and uh, corn and fried chicken, baked chicken, and roast chicken, roast chicken, and barbecue chicken, chicken gumbo, chicken purlu, chicken rice, uh, chicken and chitlins, and uh, rice and gravy, and mashed potatoes, and baked potatoes, and beef, and moo goo guy pan, and sopapillas, and enchiladas, and hot tamales, and chili, and some chop suey, and uh, iced tea, and buttermilk and pecan pie and German chocolate cake and lemon meringue pie and ice cream and it's free there'd be people fighting to get in down there and you stand up and say God has spread out a marriage feast in the sky and spread a table out there from Jupiter to Saturn and all the just men of all age are going to sit down at that table and God the Father is going to be there and God the Son and God the Holy Ghost and Mary and David and Peter and Moses and James and John and Paul and Matthew and Dwight L. Moody and John Patton and C.T. Studd and Billy Sunday and Dwight L. Moody and Bob Jones Sr. and J. Frank Norris and the cherubim and the seraphim and all the good and perfect spirits of just men from all ages and it'll last forever and it's free! Come on, let's go! And you sit there and say, well, what do those folks think of me if I walk down that aisle? Aren't people strange? They're so strange. They brought this fellow in. Now, I'm drawing wings on these angels, so you know the angels, see? Now, you know angels don't have wings, right? How many know that? Let me see your hand. Well, you better know that. But if you don't put wings on them, you don't know what they are. You know, people sit there and say, what's that? You know? <laughs> well, it's an angel. That's what it is. <laughs> and this fellow came in here, and he said, uh, Friend, how came this thou in hither, not a having a wedding garment? The fellow stepped in there, dripping the filthy rags of his own self-righteousness. Like, like wounds and sores not mollified, bound with ointment. Stinking open sores. That's the picture of man's righteousness. And the Lord said, Take that fellow and bind him hand and foot, and cast him out of darkness. There shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth from many a call, but few are chosen. And the fellow said, but Lord, I was president of this club and vice president of that club, and I headed up the cerebral palsy drive and the uh, heart fund. Get him out. But Lord, I graduated from college, and I was a member of this fraternity. I Out, get the thing out of here. But God, I was a vestryman. Out, throw him out. But God, I'm the vicar of Christ, and I out, out, get him out of here. <laughs> I don't want that trash in here. You've got to have a wedding garment, bud. You've got to have a righteousness greater than yours to get in. Christ said, except your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. He said that. I didn't say it. Don't you glare at me. Glare at yourself in the mirror. Cut yourself out. Christ said, if you're not better than a Pharisee, you ain't getting in. Well, a Pharisee fasted twice a week, and you don't. And he tithe, and you don't. 
that he wasn't unjust or an adulterer, and some of you are. How you think you're going to make it? You ain't going to make it. You ain't going to make it unless you get a righteousness better than what you got. So he says, throw him out. Why, the Bible says that day every knee shall bend, every head shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Brother Grace and I and these other preachers here and up and down this congregation, we're, we're, we're the off strong of this world right now. I know what they say about us. I don't know what they think about us. I haven't got any illusions about it. Not me, man. I had to stay in the whole town where I was saved. Still got a, about a prophet without honoring his own country and his own house, man. I was saved in Pensacola in 1949. Had to stay there. I had to pass to the church where I was saved. I've been right in the town where I was saved 35 years. Don't, don't think I have any illusions about what those folks think about me. I haven't got any illusions at all. But I know something. I'm on the winning side. Yeah. Every preacher in this building believes that book is on the winning side. Yeah. All you preachers, stand up if you believe the book. If you believe the book, stand up. Stand, just remain standing. Now, see these fellows here? Right, what you think about them, what you say about them, how you talk about them, I'll tell you something. Those fellows stand right there, going to live to see the day that everybody they ever preached to is converted. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a seat. You know what we're going to live to see? We're going to live to see every man, woman, and child of Rochester get down on his knees and say, Jesus is Lord. Every cotton-picking one of them. Now, we'd rather to see you do it now. Can't make you do it now. But I'll see you do it someday. Talk about the winning side. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to bat a thousand before this thing's over. I'm in about a thousand a night. You may turn down the invitation tonight. You may walk out that door just as lost as you came in, but I'll see you later. I'll see you later. I'll be up there somebody and say, Hey, Muhammad, front and center. Down, boy. A Buddha, hit the ground. Papa John Paul, hit the ground. <laughs> On your knees, boy. <laughs> we would have buried you, but we couldn't find a pole vault. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> And over here, <laughs> oh, well, well that, that's you folks up in Rochester and Cleveland. I know, I know you handle those things. And step over here, step over here, Voltaire, down, boy. They come over there and bow those knees. And the last one, the Lord says, step up here, Satan. Now, uh, what is it you were telling me out there in the mountain that day? About I'll give you all the kings of the world if you bow down and worship me? All that stuff? Down, boy. Yeah. They go down. The devil kneel and say, Jesus is Lord. And down they go. Yeah, yeah. Now that's the day we preachers have it made. But I can wait. Don't worry about my patience. I can wait. I can wait. I'm not worried about it. I know it's coming. You want to see a fellow go wild? But I go wild, man. I go wild. I'm kind of reserved down here. This shouting doesn't bother me. I like to see him get, I like to see the troops restless, boy. <laughs> I like to see him move. But I'm not very demonstrative, you know. I never did shout a ball game as far as I was saved. Never did. I don't shout enough unless I'm doing it. <laughs> I just don't like to watch stuff, you know. But you take, I'm not that way, but I'll be shouting up there, boy. When that thing comes, boy, and they crown him king of kings, I'm going to be saying, that's him, that's him. I told you, hey, see him? That's the one. There, that's the one right there, you see. Yeah. See, we gave our wives to him. We gave our kids to him. We gave our houses to him. We gave our lives to him. That's the one we're bragging about. Yeah. I bragged about him for 35 years. I've never seen him. I've never seen him. I've been standing here bragging about him like I'm bragging about him here tonight, and I've never seen him. One day I'm going to see him. Yeah. When I do, if you're not, you're down there on the same There's the one I tell you about. Right there, right there. See it right there. Right, right, right there. Right there. That's the one. Amen. Going to be a great day. Oh, let's wind things up. You want to go to hell? Trust something. You say what? Anything don't make any difference. One road to hell goes another. You want to get to heaven? Trust Christ. You want to go to hell? Trust something else. You want a happy Christian life? Judge your sin and confess them. You want a miserable one? Just do like everybody else does. You want rewards and approve of your Lord when you see him? Get to work. Get to work. You want to go to hell? Just don't do anything. Just put this off, put this off, put this off.
You'll stand up for Sunday and you'll get what you have coming to you. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, bless the message tonight. May the Holy Spirit of God honor the Word of God as you promised to honor it. The Lord, you said, if any man will serve me, him will I, Father, honor. We can't think of any greater honor, Lord, than your commendation, your approval, and blessing the Word that we preach, and saving sinners, and getting your children right, and, 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 and nourishing your flock as we try to feed them our own feeble way. We acknowledge before thee tonight we have no righteous of our own. All the righteous we have is of your Son. And Lord, if somebody here tonight that's not prepared to die, not prepared to face judgment, I pray they'll come tonight and get these things settled. Let's remain heads bowed and eyes closed while the musicians play a few minutes. I'd like to have the musicians, the organists play something for us a few minutes. And a little while we'll stand and sing. We're not going to have a long invitation tonight. But I'm not going to turn you loose from here tonight without a chance to be saved, the chance to confess Christ your Savior. And if any of you want to slip, any want to slip to the altar right now, just feel free to come and we, before, before we stand. About you Christian people, I want to give you a definite invitation tonight, a definite invitation. If you're a Christian here tonight and you're not actively engaged in the Lord's work, would you come tonight and lay yourself to the Lord's disposal and say, Lord Jesus, I'm coming to go to work for you and whatever work you have for me, by the grace of God, I'm going to try to do it. That's the invitation. Now, if you've been in the Lord's work, that's not for you. But if you're a Christian, you've never been actively engaged in the Lord's work. I'm an active, I don't mean just coming to church. I'm actively engaged in doing something for God in your community and in your church. Would you come tonight and kneel here and place yourself at the Lord's disposal? Son, go to work today in my vineyard. Would you come? We'll wait a few minutes. Some of you never passed out of track. You never have. You never have. Some of you never driven a bus. Some of you never taught a Sunday school. Would you place yourself at the Lord's disposal tonight and say, well, I'm going to go to work for you tonight? Now, let the Lord deal with you a while. Just kneel there a while let the Lord deal with you. Let him speak to you. He'll speak to your heart. He doesn't speak to an audible voice, but you'll, you'll know. You'll know. Now, let's remain in prayer a few minutes. If you're unsaved here tonight, will you come and join us here at the altar? Will you step out and come? If you're unsaved, there are several dozen here already. If you're unsaved, would you come? Step out and come the best way you know how. Let some appear lead you to Christ. That's it. Come ahead. Come ahead. Christian people, pray. When you go home, go home to the judgment seat of Christ. Don't go to the white throne judgment. Don't, don't hit the judgment as an unsaved sinner. Hit the judgment as a son of God and as a servant of God. He got it all worked out. If anybody needs any help here at the altar, would you raise your hand? If you want somebody to pray with you, if you want to do your own praying, we won't bother you. We don't believe you have to have any mediator. Your mediator is Jesus Christ. But if you want help, raise your hand. We don't mean to ignore you. If you want somebody to pray with you, counsel with you, slip a hand up. Let somebody come and have a word of prayer with you. We'll tire a few more minutes. There's somebody else tonight. Would you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior? You want to go to heaven? Trust Jesus Christ. That's all there is to it. You want to go to hell? You trust something else. That's all there is to it. That's all there ever has been to it. Preachers and bishops and popes and priests have made that thing so complicated, the devil himself couldn't figure it out. If Jesus Christ loved you enough to die for you, he'll take you the moment you come. Will you get out of that seat and come? Will you get out of that seat and come? If he loved you enough to shed blood for you, he'll take you the moment you make a move toward him. Will you make a move? Will you make a move? All right, Father, bless the invitation. May the Holy Spirit of God speak to hearts of men and women, boys and girls. May nobody leave this building unsaved. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing this song the ladies playing. Come every soul by sinner.